Uh, the title of my short pre presentation is Three R's for the 21st Century. Uh, my name's Rosalind Reed, and so I love R's. Uh, but my three R's for the 21st century are reboot, retool, and retweet. When I say I'm taking the long view, it's because uh, I'm a 20th century science communicator, and I've had to sort of learn the tools of the 21st century myself. And I know some of you are also uh, sort of making this transition, and I'd like to help you through it a little bit by helping you through my own. Um, 20th, 20th century, here's Shelley Glashow, Nobel laureate, who um, was wonderful at standing in front of students, in front of press conferences, in front of people, doing blackboard talks, um, all sorts of sort of face-to-face -face communication. Today, Shelley's still doing this. Um, he is doing it, though, face-to-face -face with the internet, with an entire online audience. So. Isn't this neat? You don't get to just stand in front of a group of, of students or journalists. You talk directly to the world. Um, but this is what I want to talk to you about. You're no longer uh, filtering your message through your students, your colleagues, uh, journalists who come to press conferences or call you for interviews. Scientists can directly talk to the world. Of course, the question is who the world listens to. So. Um, I just would like to show you these two uh, little uh, clips from uh, YouTube, and I've circled in red, uh, you know, Bill Nye has 5.8 million viewers for a wonderful video on uh, creationism and evolution. Shelley Glashow has just 1,300 uh, audience for his sort of uh, lecture that's over on the side. However, what's notable is people are listening to scientists. So. Um, how are they listening to scientists? How are they figuring out what they're, they're going to listen to? Um, filters, the new filters for the 20th, 21st century, as many of you know, are advocacy groups, entertainment media. The internet has become an inter entertainment medium. So um, everyone's trying to entertain and figure out how to get into this space. So this is the space that science is now being communicated in. It's an entertainment space. And this is the, the visual internet. It's very colorful. You see that uh, Herman, I mean, excuse me, Homer Simpson's uh, version of evolution has 22 million views. And, but some good news for science is that there are a lot of anti-science groups that are not getting a lot of pickup. If you look at the fellow on the left, he's only got 284,000 views. I know that's a lot, but for his answer to Bill Nye's video. So information filters now are the same kind of filters that we use to decide what movie to see. They tend to be social filters. Everyone is filtering through social media, and it's not just social media, it's through who your friends are, what group you belong to. So just dropping back a little bit again, this is the long perspective. 20th century, we had a type of technology that organize the transmission of scientific information through a whole lot of filters that were based on how the print economy worked. It made um, a whole lot of classes of people, uh, people like me when I was editor of American Scientist, who had wonderful jobs in this, uh, you know, as intermediaries, as filters, uh, writers, e artists, editors, publishers, distributors, librarians, all kinds of people who did the work of filtering information. 21st century has taken those filters away. New filters are here. We have venture capitalists, which means people who are interested in making uh, some serious money off uh, internet communication entertainment industry, and we have a social in infrastructure that um, creates and reinforces these social connections between people with like interests and creates echo chambers, as you will, um, and also has, uses personal filters rather than professional filters. So this places a premium on messages that are short, messages that are informal, messages of humor are entertaining. They have flair, they're hip, irony, pictures. Um, anything that connects with pop culture. So I'm showing you two very successful uh, NASA messages on the internet. So if you're a senior scientist who thinks this is just all too confusing and you wonder if this is an internet economy, an ecosystem where you can survive and communicate science, the answer is yes, because scientists actually are good at this. Back on the blackboard, what you were doing is actually what you need to do on the internet. You sketch ideas, you do back of the envelope types of things, whether as scientists or engineers. You use the, can use the informality, accessibility, and visual nature of the internet 
to give visual explanations. So here is a uh, Minute Physics with 8.6 million views on, on YouTube. These types of science communications are actually very powerful and very popular. So today, sadly, professional filters are few. There is not an economy that supports this anymore. But scientists are among the few people who are paid to create knowledge these days, and therefore that scientists sort of have to be the key knowledge purveyors and filters and participate in this way. The, you don't rely on journalists or publishers anymore. So it's discourse, it's direct communication, it's the kind of thing that happens in science itself. So ideas are contingent, there's argument, interpretations differ. It's about shared experience. Sharing the science experience of science is very easy on the internet. So uh, entertainment, <laughs> there, you have to just sort of work with, with the entertainment industry. Um, you know, there have been wonderful appearances of science, scientists on The Daily Show. Um, there are lots of participatory things that, that have happened on the internet, citizen science and so forth. These are the media through which science is communicated today. So I just want to wrap up this short presentation with my four tips as someone who's tried to adapt for how scientists need to adapt uh, to survive in this new ecosystem. And the first one is relax, um, and that is just have fun with this. It is fun. Uh, retool. Make fun with things like dry erase markers, sketching clever children who do fun videos. Um, encourage your, still, your students to develop science personalities and informal ways of expressing their science. And I, then the last one is retweet, which means you don't have to learn how to be a Twitterer or a knowledge uh, creator yourself. You need to be a good filter. People who retweet are people who find good stuff and are followed because they know what's good and they're, they're smart and other people begin to follow them. You can be that on the internet. So that is just a little bit of inspiration for the panelists who will come. Uh, I thank you and I am on Twitter as Roz Reed. I uh, look forward to hearing from you. So uh, our next presenter is Jamie Vernon. Uh, Jamie is an ARISE fellow with the US DOE, the Department of Energy, right now. He, um, like many of our panelists, has uh, a PhD and uh, worked in molecular biology research, but today he is very active in the online science community, the blogger community, uh, very interested in communicating climate science. Jamie. Thanks very much, Roz. That was a great setup, actually, for what I'm about to, to talk about here. Um, the title of my talk is Defining Your Communication Roll Through the Science of Science Communication. And what I'm going to actually do is add an R to Rosalind's talk, which is research. Uh, there is research for science communication, and there's this burgeoning field known as the science of science communication. So I'm going to just glance over the top of this concept, but hopefully you'll be able to see that there is some value uh, in the science of science communication. So as scientists, we rely largely on a, the scientific method to help us do our work. We make observations, form hypotheses, we make predictions based on those hypotheses, and we test those predictions. This allows us to most effectively advance science. But when it comes to communication, scientists don't necessarily think about it in a scientific way. We tend to go with our gut. Whatever appears to work, we do. And in some ways, I think that that's a very powerful thing right now. It's, it's actually accepted broadly in the community of, of science communication. But there is this, this understanding that there are best practices to some degree to develop an effective message. Indeed, the National Academies of Science has launched the Sackler Colloquium on the Science of Science Communication. They've had two of these events. And during those events, the idea is bringing together science communicators or scientist communicators, that's you scientists out there who want to communicate your stories, with communication scientists, people who actually study effective communications. And then, of course, you bring in your technology gurus, your social media gurus, and, and allow you to have access to the technologies to communicate your message. But this doesn't necessarily produce those excellent communicators we would like to see. I mean, you can dress up a kid as a, as a, a doctor, but I don't think you're going to look to him to treat you for your, your case of cancer. Uh, you really have to think about it from a scientific way. 
And so I, I want to encourage you to think about science communication uh, through the method of uh, developing a, an idea about how you're going to communicate. And then predicting what you would expect for, for that outcome. What are you trying to achieve and, and make a prediction based on that. And then test it. Testing in the, in the case of science communication really involves identifying your audience and gathering feedback on how your message actually influenced uh, your, out, your desired outcome. Now science communication is actually like a like spectrum. It's a spectrum of uh, fields in which you're going to communicate. And for each of those fields, there's going to be a particular skill set that's going to have strengths. For example, uh, educators and scientists are going to be particularly trying to deliver a sense of raw information. Uh, and, and education is, is a system that we can actually test. We know we, we have standardized testing for that to test our abilities. Journalists actually translate raw information into stories that are accessible and provide that content to the public in a way that is more uh, readily palatable. Now, science marketers are a different set. They have an entirely different skill set. They are either marketing or promoting a product that involves science. Science activists, we know, uh, Environmentalists uh, definitely rely on science in order to advance their particular concerns about environmentalism. And then there are politicians who actually rely on science or build their political platforms on science. Uh, we could take Al Gore's position on, on global warming, for example. He's actually relying on science and he's folding that science into a very political platform. Now, Carl Sagan is one of the greatest science communicators uh, we've known, at least we refer to him in that way. And Carl bridged the gap across the spectrum. He was a an scientist and educator, as well as, to some degree, an activist. And some people think of him as something of a controversial character. Uh, he involved himself in the nuclear arms race. As you can see here, uh, Carl says, the nuclear arms race is like two sworn enemies, standing waist deep in gasoline, one with three matches, the other with five. So the message here is that uh, he's participating in the debate over nuclear arms. That participation in a policy debate may or may not have affected his credentials as a scientist, and it's something we need to think about. And the science of science communication looks at this very carefully. So the question is, sh should scientists communicate on policy? Well, John Krosnick, a Stanford professor, has studied this. And what his conc final conclusion is really, when we claim to have expertise as scientists and offer opinions on matters in the world, we need to be guarded about how far we're willing to go. And why is this? It's because scientists are very good in their fields, but they're not necessarily experts on communication. Dan Gahan, a science communicator uh, or scientist of science communication at Yale, says scientists are filled with conjectures that are plausible about how people make sense about information, only some fraction of which are correct. And that tells you that we need to uh, develop our understanding of this field of science communication. John Krosnick did a study to identify the impact of scientists communicating in the policy space. What he basically did was he had scientists talk about their research. And then he had them talk about the science and how it relates to policy. And he showed videos of these talks to the public. The results of that were simply striking. The viewers trust in the scientists dropped 16 percentage points when they found that they were commenting on policy from 48 to 32 percent. Their belief in the scientist accuracy fell from 47 to 36 percent. And their overall trust in all scientists, that's the entire community, went from 60 to 52 percent. So the question is, should scientists comment on policy? Well, there is a science to this. And Ed Maybach would dispute that scientists should not comment on, sci on policy. He says that there is an important role that scientists can have in the policy discussion. And in order to participate, they must make the distinction between their expertise as scientists and their personal opinions or personal perspectives on the policy. And when they do that, they're much more likely to have uh, an open reception from the public. So it's due to science of science communication that we're we are able to understand these types of uh, relationships between our communication practices and our science. 
So it's really up to you to decide where do you want to be on the spectrum. And based on where you choose to fall on that spectrum, uh, you will apply specific skill sets that are being developed through the science of science communication. So this is my email if you want to contact me. My hashtag or, or my handle on Twitter is at JLVernonPhD. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Jamie. So uh, I hope all of you are getting some provocative ideas. We've got even more to come. So I'd like to introduce Danielle Lee. It's my pleasure. I've just met Danielle. Uh, she's better known as Dian Lee online. So um, Danielle is a biologist and outreach scientist who uh, is especially passionate about outreach to uh, younger, to teenagers, to um, younger scientists, especially in urban communities. And she has a blog called The Urban Scientist. There's um, a bio of all of her accomplishments, which are significant uh, in the program. But I hope that we'll um, hear from her about engaging broader audiences in the understanding of science. Thank you very much. Hey there, how y'all doing? So when you think about readers and consumers of popular science information, some of the reports say that the typical reader of a popular science magazine, such as Discover or National Geographic or even Scientific American, tends to be a white male, middle age, usually college educated and middle income. And if we think of that as the typical reader of popular science information, then we're leaving so many different audiences out of, out of the loop, and they're not participating in these science conversations, even the controversial ones as well as the everyday ones that affect their health, their environment, and the decisions that they make for themselves and their families. And one of the things I focus on is how do we use different audiences to communicate science that's relevant to them. And so I focus on using hip hop pedagogy to speak to, speak to audiences that are more like myself from urban settings. And so I, I titled this Pass the Mic, Broadening Science Communication Participation as well as Audiences. By new audiences, I mean speaking outside of those typical demographics, African American, Latin American, immigrant communities, deep inner city as well as deep rural communities. And one of my models I tell to young scientists as well as young science communicators is that you outreach to audiences that you best identify with. Do not try to go beyond your own personal comfort zones because you'd be surprised how many people are already itching to know more science and to have someone communicate it to them in a way that's relevant and relatable and easy to think about. And so these are some of the things that I've been able to successfully do by identifying audiences that I myself uh, relate to. And there are many, many venues. And some of the things that I encourage scientists to think about are those target ethnic audience media outlets. So I tend to focus on African American magazines. Ebony Magazine, both online and the print edition, has been around for over 50 years. And particularly in inner city urban communities, it is, con is considered the main flagship communication for broad African American middle class audiences. There's also radio programs as well as websites. And all of these organizations have their own audiences already built in beyond that typical popular science demographic. And finding a way and encouraging existing science communicators to pitch stories to these magazines, these newspapers and radio stations would immediately open up new audiences. Plus there are many styles, consider multilingual newspapers in different cities, and to have in, uh, communicators communicate in a culturally relevant way. This brings to mind that when it comes to science communicators, we need new and diverse uh, voices. We need to cultivate new communicators. Social media has democratized information and journalism, and science journalism is not excluded from this. Science blogging is an on-ramp to citizen science journalism when it comes to science. And I think it's very important that we find ways to partner with affinity groups, such as UNITY, National Association of Black Journalists, or the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, as well as the Native American Journalists Association. These three demographics alone represent way underserved, as well as underrepresented communities in science, as well as science communication. 
And I think a very easy thing to do is to foster science journalism programs at existing tribal colleges as well as historically black colleges, offering either corresponding courses, webinar courses, or even finding ways to sponsor semester-long science journalism classes it, within existing J schools at these affinity or, uh, universities. And I think it's very important that even though there aren't very many, there are more than we think that there are to reach out to minority science and health journalists. The other thing to keep in mind that there are so many opportunities for minority journalists that they may not go into science journalism. The average African American newspaper, website, or magazine does not have a dedicated science or tech section. So you may have to work with journalists who focus on health and medical issues or community issues and then help them see the science in their stories, such as environmental justice. This is actually late breaking. There was a science researcher, Apura Mandavili, who was at the National Association of Science meeting just three days ago. And what she found was that in a meeting of 500 people, she was able to count on her hand how many persons of color, so minorities, that actually participated in the conference. So this is a, this is a call. This is a call to action that when we have underrepresentation, we're not getting information not only out to new audiences, but we're missing the perspectives of those individuals to see what's happening in their communities in ways that are personally relevant to them. And we're missing the opportunity to see these problems and to get around them and solve them. Um, and a new Twitter hashtag has been brought up as a result of this conversation, DIV, uh, so diversity science writer, DIV, SCI, WRI. So we're talking around solutions to helping to cultivate more journalists of color who focus on science, environment, and health issues. And finally, I think it's important as those of us as scientists speaking to other scientists, so this is the in reach. We need to really, really play up why communication matters. And we really, really need to amplify the voices of those who are already underrepresented in our fields. It is time that we put new faces on the dais. Um, we need to profile scholars and researchers of color, as well as those from first generation families, immigrant families, and we need to really, really focus on helping their research get out to new audiences. For the most part, most scientists address issues that are interesting to them and addresses our own pain points. And when we have so few people outside of the typical homogenous group of white, male, older, middle class, we're missing all those important information and those important questions that affect so many people, and we're missing their voices in science communication in those papers that those people read, so within those community. So we do need to start tapping for diverse STEM expertise on news programs, when we call for quotes in newspapers, and we can use existing professional societies. And you can ask simply, if you're a journalist, I need to speak to a scientist of color about this issue. I want to get a quote from someone new. So helping get new faces and new forces quoted, helping get new people on deuses at scientific programs, as well as science communication programs. And I listed just a few professional science societies, and these are affinity groups. NSBE, this is the Society of Engineers. There's a Society of Black Physicists. There's another Society of Black Chemists and Chemical Engineers. There's even the Black PhD Network, which is an integrated organization of black PhDs internationally across multiple disciplines, as well as SACNAS, which is for Chicano and Native Americans, and as well as minority, uh, and minorities in agriculture and uh, natural resources and related careers. And the last one is in biomedical research. And finally, a really good place, one good directory is Diverse Scholar, which has, a, has binders full of minority scientists. Um, and, and, and I mean that literally. And so there are expertise out there, and we're encouraging people to reach out to them. I'm going to leave you with these references, which can be accessed, so you can check online later. But I hope that helps you understand why it's important to bring new people to the table and pass the mic in science communication. Thank you, Danielle. I think you accomplished many of those goals just by being with us today. So, so I, uh, we're now going to switch to Corey Powell. And uh, Corey, I'm particularly uh, glad to have here as the current editor of American Scientist and uh, continuing in the great tradition of American Scientist editors. Um, Corey is also a visiting scholar right now, teaching in the science journalism program at NYU. He um, 
uh, goes uh, way back like I do in scientific communication, having uh, launched the first website for Scientific American and also worked uh, at Discover and as an author, science journalist. Very glad to have you, Corey. Well, thank you, and uh, thank you also for for, uh, for the previous speakers who very nicely set up what I'm what I'm talking about. Uh, especially uh, uh, Dean Dean Lee set up an interesting a aspect of the the, so, the so overall ecosystem of, of science journalism that even as there's been an explosion in the media landscape, uh, there's, there, people are blogging, people are tweeting, there are all sorts of different formats that were not available a few years ago, uh, but still a lot of people are feeding the, from the same stories and from the same uh, kind of establishment news sources. And so a lot of the same old questions have just been kind of transferred into, into new media. And certainly for, for scientists, I think there's often a, a a vexing question of why do some things become stories and some things don't? Why do some things get uh, get latched onto and get, get a lot of play while others do not? Uh, I'm coming at this from a slightly different perspective, uh, although I have a history of science background and I, I spent some time working at NASA. I'm primarily, I've, I've been a media person almost all of my adult career. Uh, I've been at, at Discover, at Scientific American, uh, I'm now here at, at American Scientist, and so um, you might say I'm, I'm part of the problem or part of the solution, depending on how you look at it. Uh, so, t just to sort of frame the psychology of the people who are who are making the news and presenting the news, uh, I looked at what different organizations regarded as the top science stories of 2012. And I started by looking at CNN and CNN.com, and this is this is fairly representative of what I would call sort of the, the mainstream news media attitude towards science. Uh, so, if you look at their top ten stories. Um, and you just sort of categorize the type of story it is. Um, you have an astronomy story, a physics story, an exploration story, an exploration story, an astronomy story, an astronomy story, an astronomy story, a space exploration story, a space exploration story, and a medical story. Um, now what's interesting about that, um, there are stories that have strong visuals, that have an, a, a built-in sense of wonder. Um, they're stories that are very, very resolutely not controversial. There's one story in that whole list that gets at any kind of any kind of policy or personal um, personal implications. Um, so there's stories that do not scare away advertisers. That are not they do not require a great deal of sort of depth of of consideration for the for the reporter to to grapple with. Uh, so they're they're relatively you know they're relatively easy sells and they're relatively easy stories to report. Now let's let's jump to the the under end the other end of things. This is uh, the AAAS uh, as part of uh, the, the the journal Science uh, picking its top uh, science stories of of 2012. And you'll notice there's a, there's a there's a little bit of overlap, but a very very different kind of mix. Um, uh, the, you have the, the Higgs boson, but then you also have an anthropology story, a genetics story, uh, a kind of a deep physics story, a, a deep um, I guess you would call it you know, biology, and, and, uh, and it really is both biology and genetics. Uh, you know, a, a space and astronomy story, a material science story, a technology story, uh, another deep physics story, and a, and, a, and a very different type of more policy-oriented uh, um, biology and medicine story. Uh, a very different mix, and this, this, this is what I would say sort of the, the mainstream science perspective is on, on what the big developments were. Now, of course, I'm not a, an impartial observer here because I was also participating in this process. I was the, the editor of Discover Magazine at the, at the time that these lists came out, and here's Discover's own list of the, of the top 10 stories. And again, uh, you, see some, you see some overlap. You see something new in this list, which again reflects some of what I think is important, some of what I think is underrepresented in the, in the, in the media landscape, which is uh, important science stories with important policy implications. And so here you see climate change in the list. Here you see energy in the list. Um, here you see a, a, a sort of a behavioral health issue with a, what they call social jet lag. Um, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it, it's a new it's sort of it's a new spin on the old idea of what of what sleep deprivation does to us biologically. So again, there, there there are some there's some overlap, but I come to it with a slightly different agenda, an agenda 
of, of, of blending science and policy and looking at how science plays out in society. But this next one was the one I think that, that really interested me. So this is, this is back to AAAS. This is back to scientists mostly speaking to other scientists or to a very high level uh, lay science audience of, of people who are, who are very well educated. The, uh, the, the first list that I showed you was what the, the journal Science listed as their official editorial top science stories of the year. This is what the, the, the AAAS website, uh, Science Now, listed as their favorite stories of, of the year. Uh, these are stories that got the most traffic or that sort of got the most attention from, uh, the, from, the, from the web editors. You'll notice it's a totally different list. In this case, there's, there's no overlap whatsoever. And there's something very interesting. I mean, each of these stories are, it's, they're all weird science, surprise science, funny science, scatological science. Uh, uh, with just one or two uh, exceptions here, they're, they're almost all stories that are designed to, you know, to, make, you, to make you laugh, to make you gasp. Uh, I thought it was very interesting that, you know, even a journal like Science, which is, you know, which you know, theoretically, um, you know, the AAAS is very involved in science policy. AAAS is very, uh, you know, publishes you know the the leading American general general interest uh, science journal, um, and yet there's this incredible schism between uh, here's what we think is important and here's what we here's what we enjoy reading or here's what we think the public likes. Uh, so that, that I think that there's a real message embedded in there about why certain stories get covered and why they get covered the way they do. Uh, there's certain types of stories that are ju just inherently overreported stories, and that previous list gives you some insight into what they are and why. Um, weird science stories, funny science stories, uh, st you know, stories that that one way or another, you know, are, are designed to kind of get at that at that you've got to be kidding me kind of reflex or the laugh reflex. Uh, if anybody knows about the, the Ig Nobel Prizes, the Ig Nobel Prizes uh, is, a, you know, is a, an attempt at making a, a, a science outreach effort based on the idea of science that seems too absurd to be true. Um, there's this category of pure wonder science. That's, that's really what dominates the, the CNN list and dominates a lot of the, the mainstream news coverage. Uh, this, this, this term woo or woo-woo science stories, uh, believe it or not, that's actually a, an official term that's often used within media circles. Um, the old editor at Discover when I started there actually had a, had a story mix for each issue that there had to be one woo-woo story in every, in every issue uh, that, was, you know, it was, that was the opposite of a news you can use story, something that was just about the, the wonder of discovery. Um, horse race science, I mean, this is again, you know, the, the, the ecosystem of how politics is covered has totally spilled over to the way that science is covered. Who's going to be the first to, to, you know, to make commercial space flight? Who's going to be the first to achieve some, some kind of uh, advancement? And, and then controversy science. And all too often that ends up being Sort of consigned to the to the the he said she said uh, debate segments where they're debating climate change or they're debating you know, teaching of creationism. Uh, then there are the the chronically underreported stories, uh, abstract stories like mathematics, uh, st you know, statistical stories, uh, stories that take a long time to absorb, uh, th stories that are contrary to the expected narrative, and very subtle policy stories. I think a, a, a quintessential one in this case would be. Uh, understanding radiation risks, for instance, the actual risks of radiation leaks from the Fukushima uh, nuclear plant versus uh, the risks associated with uh, coal-generated power. Um, you know, fortunately, there there are some there are some correctives that are in the process right now, and you've heard some of them in the in the previous speakers, and you'll be hearing more further on. Um, this ex this incredible expansion of the media landscape is starting to erode uh, these traditional narratives. It's letting people select more of what they want to see, what, more of what they want to hear. It's giving scientists more of a platform for speaking directly to the public, but it really depends on having that communication work effectively, having venues that the public can find, and when things like you know, open access to journals uh, and you know, all, all of these really come down to a question of quality control, uh, quality control of what the scientists are saying and quality control of what the journalists have access to. So thank you very much. And uh, I turn over to my next speaker, uh, Bethany. 
Thank you, Corey. Uh, Bethany Brookshire is a science blogger who uh, is best known as uh, SciCurious. She um, fin recently finished a postdoc at the Penn School of, of Medicine, um, but has also been uh, a leader of the science blogging community throughout her studies and her postdoc work. So um, only recently was it revealed that the famous blogger known as SciCurious is Bethany Brookshire, so I'm very glad to have her. Thanks. Thanks very much, Roz. Um, so I really appreciate having uh, the opportunity to speak at the end. It's a lot of fun um, because I get to make all the extra special points. Um, so I think that we've seen a beautiful introduction to you know, what social media can be used for to help advance the science communication landscape. Um, we have all sorts of new platforms that can be used, things like Twitter, Facebook, Interesting things like that. Um, I would like to talk about the perspective of doing this communication, doing it well, and doing it cautiously, because that is important. So a little bit about me. Um, yes, I am sci curious. People do call me that, actually. Um, and I was a postdoc in psychiatry at University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. Um, but I am now a professional science blogger. That is my job at Science News and at Student Science, run by the Society for Science and the Public. Um, so this is now my full-time job. It's what I do. It's a job that did not exist 20 years ago, um, which is somewhat shocking, but kind of awesome. So what I have to tell you about the internet is that on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. Everyone's heard that popular statement, no one knows you're a dog. But everyone can potentially hear you bark. On the internet, everyone can potentially know about you. That is good, that is bad, and it can also be ugly. It can also be completely insignificant. Um, so I'd like to talk about some of the social involved in social media. So let's start with the good. Um, if you can see the screen cap on the screen here, this is the Science is Vital campaign. Um, the Science is Vital campaign was in the UK and uh, designed to stop cuts to science funding they got a huge amount of social media support, mainly from other scientists, um, people doing science outreach, and it actually worked. They actually were able to stop cuts to science funding, which, you know, looking at the state of science funding in America these days is really, really impressive. Um, and they're still going. They're still doing really great work. Um, this here is a hashtag that appeared on Twitter. Um, this is the hashtag overly honest methods. Um, it's pretty hysterical, and it helps to reveal the lives of scientists, who we are as scientists, not just our work, but who we are as people. Um, if you look at the bottom there, the incubation lasted three days because this is how long the undergrad forgot the experiment in the fridge. Uh, the second from the top, the Eppendorf tubes were shaken like a Polaroid picture until that part of the song ended overly honest methods. We all as scientists know that these things happen, but they're the things that get carefully scrubbed out of our method sections, which are very dry and clinical. This Twitter hashtag helped to make scientists real and interesting people. Um, and then we have this icon here represents the Facebook group I freaking love science, um, <laughs> which is an incredibly popular Facebook group which spreads the wow factor of science. This was the good. People reached out, the world listened. But that's not everything. There is the bad. There are the anti-vaxxers, the people who want to take the fluoride out of your water. Um, this guy who decided that obese PhD applicants should not uh, do dissertations because they don't have the willpower to stop eating carbs. Um, this guy who uh, said that uh, Society for Neuroscience in New Orleans had a preponderance of ugly women and wondered why ugly women were attracted to neuroscience. The world listened. That was a problem. If you are on the internet and you hear you want to say something and you run it over in your head and it sounds very clever and snarky and makes you sound kind of mean, don't write it. Don't put it on the internet. This is important. <laughs> and of course, the real problem is many people who try and do science communication end up slightly ineffective. Um, with things like blogs, you have to be prepared to put in the time. Um, for things like Twitter, you know, who you follow is as important or more important than what you say. And with Facebook, 
Who you engage and when you engage them determines a lot about the outcome. The involvement and how you do it makes or breaks social media. Now, just to finish up, I understand that many people don't want to do Twitter, many people don't want to do Facebook, many people don't want to have a blog. That's okay. The world does not need every scientist to blog. That's awesome. But you do need to have a place on the internet that shows who you are and what you do as a scientist, as a professional. Because if you do not say it for yourself, someone else will. And you may not like what they have to say. So it's important, and this is uh, Bradley Wojtek, he's got a really great lab web page, to get your page out. Reporters will find you, journalists will find you, other scientists may find you, and potential students may find you as well. And as I mentioned before, maintaining professionalism is an extraordinarily important thing. Read it over before you write it. If you wouldn't say it at a cocktail party, do not say it on the internet. Um, so thank you very much for your time, and I think we are taking questions at this time. I'm turning it back over to Roz. Yeah, thanks, Bethany. Um, we had a, another panelist who was unable to make it today, but sent some slides. And I don't know if Corey, are you Corey, uh, will be able to give us a little bit of the uh, at least of the flavor of Dennis Meredith's slides. Uh, so you get a double dose of me, this time standing in for, for Dennis Meredith. Uh, he's the chair of the Sigma Xi Publications Committee. That doesn't begin to tell you the, the depth of Dennis's experience. Uh, he's been involved with science communication all of his career. Uh, he's written over a, a thousand different uh, science releases. Uh, he's been deeply involved with both the Nas National Association of Science Writers and with, uh, with the AAAS and various t science communication uh, positions. And so you know, Dennis has a, a, a unique position uh, and unique perspective on this. Uh, I'm going to be going somewhat quickly through his slides, but the, I mean, the key thing here is, is Dennis wanted to really analyze you know, what's, what's, what's good and what's bad in the, in the, in the shifting media landscape. Uh, Network, the, the, the traditional television networks really do not cover science news. Um, now, in some ways, it's, the good news is that the, uh, the network audience is itself shrinking, so their, their, their relevance here is declining. Uh, traditional newspapers are covering less science news. Their circulation is declining. Uh, one downside of all this is that the science news cycle in the traditional media has gotten more and more constrained. And if you just sort of follow through the, the cycle here, uh, it's something that you'll all be familiar with. A, a, the, the, a journal starts out with a research showing that there's a, a weak correlation between two factors. By the time you're done, uh, the story is, oh no, this you know, A causes cancer. My God, you, you stop eating this immediately. Uh, so you can just sort of watch the cycle. Um, now, scientists have a role here in being very careful about communication. When asked to, to popularize and explain the so what of their research, they have to be able to, ready to explain the so what. Uh, and again, I won't, I won't talk through all these things, but scientists tend to think in terms of the way they report in journals, and that's different than the way that, that media people listen, and that's different than the way an audience responds. Um, now, some good news. Uh, there's a new audience, and we, we've been hearing different parts of it, that, that uh, the web audience, the Twitter audience, the Facebook audience, that, that, that you know, as traditional media decline, there are more and more places to hear about, about science. And amazingly, through all these changes, scientists have remained an incredibly trusted profession. Uh, and just a few statistics here. Uh, people don't trust journalists, but they, but they, but they trust scientists. Uh, and so there's actually a tremendous audience out there ready to hear directly from the scientist. Uh, science, of course, is, is very widely represented in the, in the popular media and in the pop culture uh, more than ever before. I think you know, certainly the rise of, of science fiction movies and, and, and sort of you know, science-influenced fantasy movies, uh, you, you, know, you recognize a lot of the images here, and the fact that you do is a, is a testament to just how deeply science has permeated our, our pop culture. Uh, now the, you know, the, the sort of the, the closing thought here is, okay, great. You know, there, there are new opportunities for expression. There's a lot of public interest. There's a lot of public trust. Um, there still is, even now, a, a, a fundamental disconnect between uh, the level of, of interest and respect in the public and the idea in the, within the scientific community of 
how important it is to be a communicator. And that's changing, but it's, it's changing slowly. And I, and I think you know, one, of the, one of the real paradoxes is that you see universities uh, spending a great deal of money and effort in their, you know, their public information offices or their public outreach offices uh, where there's a lot of emphasis and then on the other hand, you know, within the actual departments, scientists often, especially young researchers, get very little support for doing public outreach. And that's something that I think that's a, that's a problem that we need to crack if we're really going to get to the next stage. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you again, Corey. Dennis was going to be our moderator today, and we were very sorry not to have him. But uh, nevertheless, we've managed to hear a good deal about uh, the, the new age, what's happened to media what scientists should do about diversity issues, about policy issues, and many, many things, connections that science communication can help make for science. So we hope all of you have been inspired to become fantastic communicators, to reach out to new audiences, to have your own website, to tweet. Um, we are not taking questions directly because of the nature of the setup, but we uh, know that you've all seen the hashtag at the bottom of the screen uh, during the slides, and that we will be uh, hoping to hear from you via Twitter and any medium that you feel comfortable communicating on. So thank you to all of our panelists and thank you for listening.